How great is our God? We serve a mighty God. Can we celebrate Khalil uh, Moore and uh, on the drums and uh, Elder Neil by the name of Thank God for them today and their participation in this worship experience. God bless you. We are ready to start this morning service and we are starting out going to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And we're going to start off with verse 1. Let me give you just a moment to catch up with us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4. The word of God reads as follows. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Let us take a moment together as we pray and talk to the Lord. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity and this privilege of worship. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way today. We honor you for all that you've done. Perhaps there's someone out there listening this morning. Ask that you would touch in a mighty way a soul that needs to be saved, someone that needs deliverance, someone that just needs to be lifted up in their spirit to know that you are present with them, even at times like these. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord, we be your prayer. Amen. For the next few minutes, as the Holy Spirit deals with me, I want to speak to your hearts on the word drifting. On this word drifting. Praise the Lord. We've read out of Hebrews chapter 2, and we certainly want to hone in on this word drifting. What is the first thing that you think about when you think of drifting? Well, um, I think of something that often happens uh, if you didn't get sleep last night. Perhaps you're here in church this morning or listening via live stream. You're tired. You just may drift off while I am preaching. Well, I hope you're able to stay awake for just a few minutes. But we think of drifting in other ways. I'm thinking of times that I have been on a, uh, a trip uh, at a resort, and I'm out uh, on the water park and, and on a raft, and that raft just kind of drifts out on the calmness of what's going on. Just makes you feel good. Just lean back and enjoy. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Just enjoy the moment. Drifting. There are, there, there are good driftings, but there are some not so good driftings. If you were at Niagara Falls, for an example, they have warning signs about drifting, but drifting in the wrong direction in terms of uh, they have warning signs saying, now look, don't drift in this direction because you could fall over the cliff at Niagara Falls. So drifting has some good points, but it also can have some challenging points. But my drifting that I want to talk to you about today is talking about spiritual drifting, if you will. That word drift, when it comes, uh, so this is what I think of when I think of drifting, because there are different ways that we can drift. But in the writing from the, the writer is addressing uh, this letter to believers, if you will. And uh, there is a real possibility that a believer can drift away from God and God's word. You don't believe it, just keep living. And you will find that if you don't hang around the saints, if you don't engage in the word of God, if you don't build your spiritual muscles, something can happen to you in your spiritual life and it won't be nice. Praise be to God. But I want you to understand that it is important that we build our spiritual muscles by staying in the word of God. 
I remember some time ago, Tom Hanks, which is one of my favorite uh, actors, if you will, uh, and that was a movie called Castaway. And Tom, he plays an ex, uh, ex a FedEx employee named Chuck, who was stranded on a deserted island. Uh, what's interesting about this, Chuck was so lonely that he makes friends with a volleyball that he called Wilson. Well, Wilson was his constant companion. Uh, it's interesting because uh, when he was on the, he was on a raft one day, uh, and a wave came flashing his way, knocked Wilson out of his hand, and Wilson began to drift away. Oh, uh, Chuck wasn't paying attention, but he jumped and shot infested waters to save Wilson. And he, but Wilson was bobbing around until he bobbed and bobbed further out to sea. But uh, and then finally, Chuck said, Tom Tom Hanks said, Wilson, Wilson. Oh, Wilson, I'm sorry, Wilson. And he breaks down crying. Tom Hanks is a pretty good uh, actor, if you will, when he can actually make adults cry at something like that. But there's, there are thousands of Christians who are like Wilson. They have been slowly drifting away from a place of great joy and peace and service for the Lord. Yes, we all know people who at one time were faithful servants of the Lord, but all of a sudden you can't find them, you don't find them in church again. They, they drift away from the Lord. You may be drifting right now. Drifting is something that happens slowly and gradually. You ever stayed away from church for a little while and all of a sudden it wasn't important that you be there? You just feel okay, and then the world's ways of thinking start drifting into your mind. I want you to know drifting is something that, that does happen slowly. And yes, the, uh, but the, the, here's the truth about spiritual drifting. You never drift toward holiness. You drift away from holiness. You never drift toward faithfulness. You drift to faithlessness. You never drift toward goodness. You drift toward wickedness. Praise be to God. So uh, John Colson wrote something like, he said, most of us are in danger of plunging into the sea of carnality. Don't you know that again, if we don't work on our spiritual selves, we will become carnal Christians. Are you drifting away, my brothers and sisters? Are you drifting away? Do you know someone who is drifting away? Well, I want to give you four points this morning about drifting that is so dangerous to our spirituality. The first thing that I would like to say is that uh, I drift away when I listen to God's word, but my life doesn't change. I listen to God's word, but my life doesn't change. Spiritual drift occurs when we stop paying attention to the word of the living God. Yes, verse 1 says this. Listen to verse 1 that we just read. We must pay more careful attention Therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. See, this letter was written to Jewish believers who had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but they, uh, and they were in Judaism, but the fact of the matter is they turned from the rules and the rituals of Judaism uh, to place their faith in Jesus Christ. But they were slipping back into the old comfortable religious rituals and rules. Yes, the first time they heard the gospel, oh, they were on fire for the Lord. And they were on fire for the Lord because now it's all about grace. Wow, grace. That's amazing. That amazing grace. But you mean I, I don't have to observe the, stat, the Sabbath rules and the dietary laws? That's amazing grace. But the more they heard it, the less amazing it became. And it became old hat, if you will. That can happen with Christians today. You hear the gospel time and time again, and you keep hearing the gospel. You've heard the gospel of grace so many times that it has lost its sense of wonder and amazement in your Christian life. It's like the first time uh, that you uh, may have flown on an airplane. I noticed that when I first flew on an airplane, those first few times, I would pay close attention to the, air, the, 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 the person that's standing out there showing me if this happens, you do that, if that happens, and so forth. You are okay. But if you've been flying on that plane hundreds of times, all of a sudden, you don't pay attention. 
listen to uh, their airline attendant. It's just old hat to you and you just don't pay attention. And that's what can happen in your spiritual life. We can sit here under the power of the Holy Spirit and nothing happens because it becomes old hat to you. I heard it before. But the gospel ought to excite somebody because it's the gospel of grace that saves us from our sins. James warns us about the danger of being hearers of the words, but not doers of the word. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? There was a survey that was conducted, and they said these words that 13% of the people in the U.S. read their Bible every day. In other words, my brothers and sisters, 13 out of 100 people read their Bible on a daily basis. I want to ask you, do you read your Bible? Oh, if you want some spiritual strength, you've got to read the Word of God. You've got to engage in the Word. And when you stop obeying God's Word, you face the danger of drifting away. Amen. Even pastors can drift away. Just again, uh, uh, yeah, there was a story, for an example, of, of a pastor. You, you probably heard of the hymn, Come Thou Fount. Uh, but there's an amazing, interesting story behind this. The words say, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. To my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. The third verse says, Prone to wonder, Lord. I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. You see, British pastor, uh, Baptist pastor Robert Robinson, he penned these words in, at the age of 22 in 1757. He had been converted under the uh, a powerful preacher of George Whitefield. And at the age of 26, he became the pastor of Stone Yard Baptist Chapel in Cambridge. He preached salvation through Jesus Christ alone, and the church grew to 1,000 members. But in a few years, Robert, uh, the pastor of the church, started drifting uh, from what he had heard, what he had, uh, had been teaching. A liberal uh, uh, Unitarian professor challenged his belief in the Bible. And during that time, he became convinced that this Unitarian professor was right, and he drifted away from God. And then the church started dying as a result. I want you to know that the Bible scholar Warren Worsby, which is one uh, a scholar I encourage you to check out and read his writings. But Warren Worsby, one day, he said one day Robert was traveling in a stagecoach from Cambridge to London. And a young lady was reading a book. Well, she turned to Robertson and said, sir, this is a, a wonderful hymn. Do you know it? He recognized the hymn, Come Thou Fount." And he broke down and confessed that he had written the words of that hymn as a young man. But now he had wandered away from Almighty God. The young lady uh, said that, but as you wrote, God's streams of mercy are never ceasing. And, and through her encouragement, Robert restored his life to the Lord. And he rediscovered uh, the joy of his salvation. He started believing and he started preaching and teaching the word of God, the Bible again. And he faithfully served the Lord until his death at age 55. You see, you can drift away from God, but thank God you can come on back home. And if there's somebody out there right now that's listening to me and you've drifted away from God, you can come on back home right now. Amen. Point two. The second thing I like to say about drifting is that I, 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 can, I drift away when apathy replaces a desire together with believers. Apathy replaces a desire together with believers. You see, do you know what apathy is? Do you care what apathy is? I, I, they, they, they gave a survey uh, to Americans asking, what's the biggest problem of our country, ignorance or apathy? And most common answer was this, I don't know and I don't care. Uh, when it comes to attending church, some people just don't care. Yes, sir. It's a simple mathematical effect that there are millions of people on the rows of churches uh, like uh, in the United States, who have never, who never docked the doors of the church. In almost every church that I know of, about 50% of the members never give a penny. Or they never attend a single service except on Easter. Y'all don't hear me? I say they never attend a service or they don't give 50% except 
on Easter. When someone asks me, uh, uh, how many members you have at First Baptist? I might say something to stand and answer is around 200. Praise the Lord, or somewhere headed up in that number. Uh, but the FBI couldn't find half of them. First Baptist investigators couldn't find half of them. I know that might sound like a little joke. But the fact of the matter is, we have people that uh, you know where those uh, non members are, are today, those non attending members are. They're either attending somewhere else, or they're sitting at their home right now, or they're hanging out at the lake, or they're going out shopping, but they're somewhere. And I've been asked before, why don't you just take them off the road? Well, we don't want to, those people to be forgotten. We remember them. We want to pray for them. We want them to be part of the family of God. Yes, we want them to be part of this caring community, Amen. the faithful. Yes, we'll regularly call them. My deacons will help call these members in to ensure that they are, are, are become a part or get re-engaged in the life of the church. Do you know uh, what most of them say? Well, sure, I want to remain as a member, uh, but I guess I just hadn't been around. It's become a habit. I hadn't been around. Well, you need to engage with the people of God. Yes, you do. We need to lovingly remind them that there is an eternity of difference between your name being, being written on a church roll and your name being written in the Lamb's book of life. I tell you, we're going to have to give an account of ourselves one day. Yes, we know this because uh, this, this was a problem among the Hebrew believers. If you don't believe it, read in Hebrews 10. The writer addresses these non, no show Christians. Yes, sir. He said, let us not neglect to assemble ourselves together uh, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back? The day is near, and we need to come together to encourage one another. We need to come together so that we won't drift away. I've been to, I, I've said it before, uh, but going to church doesn't make you a Christian no more than going to a garage makes you a car. Yeah, but if you love the Lord, I said if you love the Lord, you will walk together with God's people and you're on a regular basis. But I know I'm literally preaching to the choir right now, but you, if you love him, you will show it by coming around when the doors are open. You'll come and listen to the live stream. But more than that, we need to fellowship one with another. There are some who aren't physically able to attend church. I know that. And we're glad uh, to come to you and to your homes by live stream. Uh, but if you are watching me and you are able to come when the doors are open and you're physically able to attend, then attend church. I challenge you to show up with God's people on the Lord's day and watch for us have a good time in the Lord. It's nothing like being around the saints of God. My third point, third or fourth point, I drift away when complacency about sin replaces confession. I drift away when complacency about sin replaces confession. My brothers and sisters, Christians, brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Uh, what are the three areas of sin in your life that you struggle with the most? Have you thought about it? Can you answer that question? How about are you in, uh, 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 how aware rather, are you uh, to the presence of sin in your life? Do you know what's going on inside of you? Praise be to God. And then I want to say, are you daily going before the Lord and asking him to reveal any wicked ways or wicked thoughts or attitudes or deeds in your life? I'm afraid that since we know that we're under grace, uh, we get lazy sometimes when it comes to sin. We know that all of our sins, past and present and future sins, have already been forgiven. But I got news for you, my brothers and sisters. God expects us to come before him when we sin, when there's sin present in our lives. The scripture tells us uh, something specific about this. And you see, it is important that we go before the Lord. One pastor was preaching a series of, uh, on the sins of the saints. And one of his members asked him, but pastor... We must remember that sin in the life of a Christian is different from the sin of a life in a lost person. The pastor replied, you're right. Sin in the life of Christians is worse. They don't know better, but we do. So when you recognize sin in your life, repent of it. Yes, confess your sins. 
once you become a Christian, sin is still present in your life. No, no, we don't get rid of it. It doesn't rain, but it doesn't rain over you. Yes, yes, but the potential to sin is still there. The Apostle John was writing to Christians when he added this subject. If we claim, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful. I said he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. All right. Oh, yes. A.W. Tozer uh, talked about the complacency of Christians is the scandal of Christianity. Yes, we can become complacent. That is the worst thing about our faith in terms of that the scandal of Christianity. If you if, if, if you aren't constant uh, constantly aware of the sin in your life, then you probably already drifted away from the convicting presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm gonna tell you, sin ought to bother you. Sin ought to bother you. It ought to tear you apart. Yes, sir, because the word of God is powerful and it's quick. Oh, it can cut your left and cut your right. Yeah, through the marrows in the bone, through every aspect of your life, the word of God ought to deal with you. Something ought to happen, and if it's not happening, you may have already drifted away. And finally, I drift away when I forget the end. Forget that ending well is more important than a good start. Let me repeat that. I drift away when I forget that ending well is more important than a good start. I'm reminded of something that really tugs at my heart. And that is, uh, many of you know LeBron James. LeBron James is considered the greatest basketball player of his time. One of the interesting things about LeBron James a few years ago, wasn't many years ago, they were playing the Golden State Warriors. The Cleveland Cavaliers were playing the Golden State Warriors. Nobody gave Cleveland a chance. Many of you, you may be fans of Cleveland, you may be fans of Golden State, but it doesn't matter. This is the important thing that happened. Uh, 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 the Golden State Warriors were on fire. In fact, they had lost two games in a row all season long, it appeared. But in this particular situation, they went up. They, they were playing a series for the championship, and you have to win four out of seven games. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Cleveland had won one game, but Golden State had won three. Everybody was about ready to turn the TVs off. So was I. I said, there is no way that Cleveland could come back being down three games to one. But I got news for you. They won game, they won that second game. So it was three games to two. I said, well, maybe that's a little light at the end of the tunnel. I said, but they got to go back to Golden State and win that game. Golden State had hardly lost any games at home. They went back to Golden State, I'm sorry, they went back home and won game six. Praise be to God, but I said, what? Here it is, tied up at 3-3. So it was a do or die in game seven, but it was gonna be held at Golden State. I want you to know they played game seven and Cleveland Cavaliers came out on top. It was amazing because Golden State had not lost two games in a row all season. But at this time, they lost three games in a row. I tell you, yes sir, it doesn't matter how you start. It matters how you finish. And when it comes to our Christian experience, it doesn't matter how you start. You may not have started off that good. But at the end of the day, if you finish well, the Lord will say, sit down, servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The Lord will. Yes, sir, don't drift away. But if you drift away, then I ask you right now to stop drifting and call on the name of the Lord and let the Lord do what he wants to do with you. And he'll take you where he wants you to be. You, can, you, can, you may have drifted, but thanks be to God, there's grace. His grace is amazing. His grace will save you. His grace will bring you back to shore. Oh, like Wilson, praise God, even though he drifted out the sea, God can bring you back to shore and save you by his amazing grace. So spiritual, spiritual drifting is dangerous. So if you want to know how to get back, I just got news for you. All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and let him bring you back. You see, uh, it is said uh, that, uh, that, that uh, I've been told that, that, that the heaviest anchors 
that that uh, one could uh, encounter are the U.S. aircraft carriers. Each of them have two, and they weigh 60,000 pounds a piece. So when they throw those anchors down, no matter how bad the weather may get, those anchors, those 60,000 pounds on each, each side of the aircraft carrier will hold that boat in place. And But I got news for you. There's somebody that can hold you in place better than 120,000 pounds. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll hold you in place if you trust him, if you lean on him, if you depend on him, if you just give him your heart, all of your heart, soul, and mind, and spirit. He will be your anchor that will never fail you. Can I get a witness, somebody? And so we could be worried of the danger of drifting away from God. And perhaps there's somebody listening to me today that you have drifted away or you've never known the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then we want to pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you would touch those that are out in listening land. Pray that you touch those that are here today, that you say to the utmost, that you move in their hearts and their lives, that you minister to their spirits, and give them, Lord, that same grace that you gave to this church, to all of the churches in our community, all around our nation and the entire world. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to the sick, to those that are hurting, to those that are depressed, those that are just going through the challenges of life, for all of the pandemic situations that we're dealing with, all of the issues related to the other issues that we're dealing with. We know that you are the great I am, and you can do it. Do it for us now, we ask in Jesus' name, and save that soul. We ask in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. For those of you that are listening today, we ask that you will indeed come by the First Baptist when we reopen. If you so choose, we're at 105 Northwest Street and uh, here in Fuquay Marina, uh, North Carolina, 27105. God bless you. Don't drift away. Drifting can be dangerous to your spirituality. And if you have, just know that you can t trust him by grace to bring you back to God bless.
します。